Hey guys, welcome to our 22nd episode of What's Next Beyond Service. Is Our episode is called Change Management, and today we have with us Josh Atkinson. Josh, welcome aboard. Welcome. Thanks, Scott. Pleasure to be here. Thanks yeah, absolutely. We're very glad to have you. So just real quick on, on Josh. Josh is a Marine. He served as Marine uh, for about 11 years in the aviation and logistics community where he did a lot of really good stuff. Uh, he's a smart guy. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we have him here, because we want to talk about all the good things he's doing now post-service for you know helping folks transition. Uh, so he, he served uh, 11 plus years on active duty. He does have some time served in the reserve community as well. Uh, he's currently he's currently working for PM ProClean, where he is their business strategist and uh, and business strategy and development. He also is working as a logistics SME for uh, Serco, which is uh, Whitney, Bradley, and Brown. He is PMP trained, uh, uh, certified at from Syracuse University, also PMP Institute uh, professional. Uh, he has a certificate from UNC, their logistics program. That's, uh, I believe that's probably the one that's connected with the, the military and the Marine Corps, one that I would have loved to go to. Uh, he also, uh, I should have said this earlier, but he's a, a Naval Academy grad. So that in itself should tell you he's a smart guy because, you know, not anyone gets to walk in those, uh, in, on those hollowed grounds and, you know, educate themselves and then serve. And uh, he has many certificates, which, you know, we'll probably talk to some of that uh, during the interview. And lastly, he is huge in volunteering. If you go to his LinkedIn profile, which I suggest you do, uh, and check out, you know, all the stuff that he's got in there that talks to his education, his certifications, and um, his volunteer work, it paints a very nice picture of, of who he is. So, uh, yeah, go Army, beat Navy. There you go. <laughs> Some folks might not be able to see that, maybe, but uh, yeah, lo love love the humor with this crowd. So yeah, you know, I think you'll you'll come to like it too, uh, there, Joshua. So okay, well, so that's that's who we're talking with today. So Joshua, with that, well, what I want to do, as we discussed in our pregame, is I want to hop right into you know you talking about you in terms of your experience. Uh, in the military. So, you know, share with us what you will with that. And then once we, you know, kind of beat that one into the deck, we'll move into your transition, your personal transition from the service. So what can you tell us there, Joshua? Right. You know, Scott, thank you for having me on. You know, again, it's an honor to be here. Um, I did get to serve 11 uh, great years in the Marine Corps and active duty. I did two more in the reserves. Um, didn't get to finish it out, right? I'm one of those, uh, Voluntold exits because the core was getting smaller and, and I pissed off some people in uniform and, and was asked to leave, but I uh, got to do some amazing things, right? So I started out in aviation, I flew Harriers for a few years, worked in squadron operations, uh, learned a whole lot really about process and leadership when I was there. Um, got to deploy with NATO as an air logistics coordinator, really got to confirm my love for logistics while I was there, you know, strat planning, um, ULNs, you know, getting into jokes and all the fun systems out there about how do you move thousands of people around the world and track that from a, a systematic standpoint, um, which really taught me a lot. So when I finally went into ground logistics afterwards with the infantry, you know, having kind of that strategic view of how do you sustain the fight in the warfighter, you know, integrated load plans and, and air routes and ground mobility. And, you know, then taking that to the tactical level with the infantry, you know, I really got to kind of merge the best of breed from squadron operations on the tactical air side to the sustainment side, you know, then, moved up and deployed with a human intelligence unit. Um, so I got to see that exposure with SOCOM, you know, and how do you affect the Intel fight with kinetic operations. And then eventually finished my time as a division plans officer, where I really got to see kind of the merger of all of my experiences, helping to do, you know, O plans and apportionments and really see where the Marine Corps could go and what capabilities we had and really how small we became relative to, to the rest of the, of the military. Um, and as reservists, I got into, you know, MSTP, doing uh, war gaming and developing, you know, war games for the MEF exercises. And again, kind of seeing the joint integration side of what the Marine Corps deals with when you go into theater, um, where I learned there that we are really, really small. And what the Army brings to the fight is the big, slow, lumbering beast, right? I got to knock on them a little bit. But once they show up, they bring everything. And there's really so That's much more capability that they can bring into the fight. So, you know, 
in a new vision right now of getting us back to that lightweight fighter, you know, the, the get in, sting, hit hard and get out, you know, kind of a model and getting us back to our roots has been really cool to see. Um, I think seeing us try to get back into expedition, expedition logistics and trying to figure out what does it mean to sustain with what you've got on your back, um, I think is a tough challenge given where we've been in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think the, the logistics and competence that we learned while we were there because you had so much and it was always right there and we didn't have to become you know, reliant on, on what we could find, but then also the impact that I think the last 20 years have really had on empowered decision-making and junior leadership trust. And I think that goes into my current passions with, you know, PM Perler and, and our vision of trying to innovate thought, right? How do you innovate leadership? How do you innovate the mind to build high-performing teams where you can trust down to the lowest possible level, you know, because, when you look at the most effective weapon on the battle space is that, you know, soldier, sailor, airman, marine, and their rifle, right, empowered to make a decision at the point of need. How do we get back to enabling that? Because I think that trust, that leadership piece really started getting missed, you know, in the last 20 years where digital technology is integrated so much, the ability to look down through technology to actions being had at the lowest levels has changed the way leadership, I think, sees things. And big data on the corporate side and how do I pull data analytics, it gives you visibility into so much more, yet that also allows senior leaders to become involved in things they probably shouldn't have any business in, right? And yes, <laughs> you know, so how do you, how do you marry that up? And even as an S4, when I got into logistics, I built what I called the flower chart, right? Where I started mapping all of the different subsections of logistics that I was responsible for, and I put timelines to it. You know, so transportation is like a five day to two week request timeline, maybe a month out, right? You know, ammo is a 90 to 120 day out, embarkation is 180 days out. So you start looking at dependencies of timelines and this is where project management really starts integrating into military planning and leadership. But when I built the dependencies and what I could affect as the S4 and where I should stay in terms of strategic operational and tactical, right? And I realized I needed to live in about three areas. Right, my four alpha at the operational side, he was involved in about three to four areas. And then my chief started being involved in about everything, but he lived really in transportation and mobility. And you know, the XO and the OPSO and I had some fights about this thing. Like, hey, why aren't you in this day-to-day -day stand up? And I was like, because I'm living, you know, future plans, right? So if I'm in the day-to-day -day operations, I'm ineffective in my responsibility and my role. And that's hard because I'm responsible for all of it, but if I'm focused on it, I'm not effective as a leader. Well, it's also challenging for, you know, say the you know, battalion commander or whoever, this, you know, whoever that guy or gal is that, you know, doesn't quite see things maybe that way because you're the primary, they, they want you there. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes they're going to require that all their primaries are at certain functions and they're not understanding of, you know, how you're trying to operate, which I, I know there's conflict with that. I, I had a boss that had a daily standup, a daily standup every yep. day. And, you know, now I was the XO, so it was a little different. But yeah, I, I know that uh, that was hard for, uh, you know, the three uh, and the four because we were with, uh, with one of the muse and you're busy as all get out uh, before you become sock certified and then absolutely before you hit all you know all everything that goes into cutting from the mlg over uh, to the mu you know to the mouth and then getting out yeah. on the water and yeah so yeah I, absolutely hey real real quick uh, what i do want to do here a couple things you said you know absolutely you know rang bells in my head you could probably hear it echoing in the background but uh, <laughs> you know i i was a low decision myself uh I served 20, just over 20 years. And at one point, uh, as a lieutenant colonel, I was very fortunate to work with uh, Third Maw. I was their uh, uh, assistant, uh, or I was the deputy G4, aviation ground logistics. I was the G4 for almost a year, but then a colonel, a colonel showed up and I took the, the right hand slot there. But Holy smokes, I learned so much about logistics, uh, certainly aviation support, uh, but, you know, all those things that you just never think of when you're on the ground side uh, doing combat uh, logistics support, 
you know, you, you, you touch aviation a bit, but man, it was a fire hose. And I, I tell you, those guys are absolute professionals. The swing with the wing thing. I mean, that sounds cool. Uh, I didn't see a whole lot of that. Uh, you know, I was there when we were uh, shifting gears to go to the fight in Afghanistan. So this is, you know, like 2008 to 10. Uh, we were busy. Uh, and I can tell you what, to a person, they are highly professional. They're very skilled. You know, they understand safety for all the right reasons with safety and flying mm -hmm. aircraft. Uh, so, you, you know, thinking about what you were saying about your experience as an aviator and then bringing that into the logistics realm, understanding the aviation piece to that, I could imagine the benefit that you were uh, to folks on the ground side. I see that as being huge. And then the second thing, talking about logistics and modernization and bringing real time support and data and analytics to commanders, to folks that are responsible for the supply chain is incredible. It's huge. Uh, I was at logistics modernization team West uh, when they went from being FASMO over to the LogMod teams. I, I did that for three, <laughs> three painful years. And I say painful because at the time, you know, we were doing the back and forth to Iraq and Commanders weren't really concerned about logistics modernization and rolling out uh, GCSS Marine Corps. And, you know, the, the one thing I think most of them were interested in was the bridging technologies that we were, you know, trying to bring along with the program. And, you know, some things worked very well. Others certainly, you know, they were they were new. They were, you know, being beta tested as we were moving forward. It's like building an airplane and flying it at the same time. But there was a heavy frustration level with the commanders uh, because, yes, you know, everyone was having their, you know, their own screen, right, their own board where, you know, the commander can, you know, set up his meatballs and he can determine what's important to him and everyone can share that. But, but yes, you're, you're right, uh, Joshua, the, the commander, you know, I think it depends on who the commander is. I think having information is power. But also, you know, trusting in your people and allowing them to do their jobs is that's pretty significant too. And so there, there's an absolute line there, uh, and and not all commanders uh, navigate that successfully, and you know, wind up doing more uh, than maybe they should uh, with the information that they have. And then I think it even leads to very unrealistic expectations, uh, you know, based on what they're looking at and then maybe what they set up as, you know, uh, significant to them. So, yeah, it, so there's, there's good and bad to the technology piece here. And, and, and you, you know, it probably better uh, than any, anybody else. So, yeah, so sorry to interrupt, but I did want to talk to those things real quick. Cause I, I, I'm, I'm with you, brother. I, I, I see it. I, I kind of lived it a bit myself. When it goes to the point on, I mean, change, and again, I think data is very powerful, but, you know, trust and team empowerment, and that goes into, you know, the agility and things that we're trying to go after in program through integration of project management, right? When you look at lean and you look at agile and you look at some of the industry concepts that are out there, right? If you want to move fast enough, you can't control it and you can't always even see everything that's going on, but you have to know where you're headed and communicate a vision and then allow people to get there, you know, and Again, there's great things like I'm working on, you know, the, the CBM plus concept for Marine Corps, right? I wrote the con op, I'm writing the ICD, the CDD, right? On like instantaneous condition reporting and how do you pull real time data into decision making that influence autonomic logistics and things that can potentially lead to, you know, instant push, unmanned drone resupply to a point in space because we can forecast and predict user requirements and maintenance condition and where that meets up with you know, the theories of EABO, you know, expedition advanced space operations and distributed maritime operations and, you know, tour operations and contested environments and all these concepts that are there. But the one thing that, again, as we look at the technology, the one thing I don't see happening, and I've talked with people at MCI East and West and various services is, have I enabled that Lance Corporal to know to make his own decision when he can't ask for permission anymore? Does he have the trust of the command to back the play no matter how the outcome comes because he had my authority as a commander and I empowered him to make that choice on his own. And we affected the way we train and lead so that failure is a part of the learning model through creativity. So we're used to making decisions and tripping on ourselves 
in a controlled environment. So when we go overseas, it's not the first time I failed. Amen. You know, and I think, you know, the PTP model, the constrained environment and training, getting ready for Afghanistan was kind of a script. And I talked to tankers back in the 90s who were using golf carts for maneuverability because they couldn't afford to put gas in the tanks anymore. I mean, you look at some of the creativity that had to occur in constrained environments, you know, that yeah, the, the Second World War, Second World War is full of that. Correct. Absolutely. But, yeah. But culturally, it, it's changed. And I think there's kind of that CYA viewpoint, you know, that's like, hey, don't violate it, don't shake the bus. And my career ended because I'm not a gray man, flat out. I don't stay in the middle. I spoke my mind. I spoke against safety violations. I spoke up against a commander who I thought was unsafe. And when shit hit the fan, I was a scapegoat, right? I mean, there's a lot more over a beer we can talk about and why, but go look up Hawthorne 2013. If you really want to know what shit looks like when it hits the fan, I'll tell you, I was the S4. And if you want to know more about it, hit me up and I'll tell you all the details. But I tried to do what I thought was right. You know, and in the end, my career suffered because I wasn't playing the political game. I wish I knew more about it because I would have done more to, I think, protect myself. But I had an amazing career, you know, and I yeah. think, again, as we go forward into the, the new peer fight and even a transition, and we want to talk about transition, but enabling people to know how to think for themselves and empowering them to decide even in their own career, their own career path. And you look at the Force Design 2030, some of the manpower initiatives, and how do we integrate better training and this is our passion is integrating industry into the military mindset so that I have opportunities to leave when I'd want to, right? Or to be more effective while I'm in, you know, it's not an in or out, it's a both. And can we bridge that to make it better? And same thing with degrees and certifications, like, is it a degree or a cert? It's like, why not both, right? So we're really trying to kind of merge a lot of these things together. So it's not an either or discussion point. So people can become more effective because even on transition, and I'll gladly go to my story on that one, but you know, we take months to build the identity and the capability, if not years, getting into the service, and we spend less than five days to help that transition go out. And I think you're kind of given that, hey, I'm dependent on you for all things living and breathing while I'm in. And then you kick me on the street as this foster, you know, foreign orphan, and I got to scrounge to figure out what the heck I want to do yeah. next. Yeah, you get a high five in the parking lot, and it's, it's all yeah. cool. <laughs> Congratulations, DD214, bye. And yeah. you're like, great, I'm a veteran. Everyone's going to swoon over me and hire me because I'm walking in with medals and accolades and they don't know what to do with you, right? And it's- Yeah, that's, that's absolutely yeah. true. Hey, uh, Joshua, real quick, before we make a transition into transition, uh, yours in specifics, uh, and then obviously we'll talk to the issue of transition as we, we do that. Uh, I, I do want to touch on something that you you brought up and uh, I-, I, I absolutely have concerns for our military right now and for the Marine Corps specifically. Um, I actually commented on a post, I think it was yesterday, it could have been the day prior, to where I actually came out and said, you know what, I never thought I'd say this, but I'm disappointed in Marine Corps leadership. And there's reasons, right? It's, you know, there's a number of things. And it's not just the Marine Corps, it's DOD, and it's the civilian folks at the top as well. You know, we can have a whole nother talk about that, but I there's absolutely problems. I'm concerned with where the Marine Corps is going uh, in terms of capabilities. You know, uh, the Commandant, uh, he's made a decision uh, to, for lack of a better word, gut some core capabilities of the Marine Corps, and he's leveraging attempting to leverage that for future capabilities and reshaping the force. I mean, I'm all about getting back to our expeditionary roots. That's what Marines are. Uh, we got sucked into what happened the past 20 years because the Army couldn't maintain it themselves. There's absolutely no doubt about that. You know, when you get into how they weren't prepared to use their reserve force over the years. Now, I guess no one really thought we'd be doing it this long, but a lot of smart folks were involved. You know, there was there was no phase zero in planning in any of this. There's, you know, we we learned, but then we forget. We do that all the time. It, it, it happens. So, you know, as we're changing the Marine Corps, you know, <laughs> we need to be empowering those junior folks, just like you talked about. We need to have them understand what failure is and how you had, what are the workarounds for that? You know, because there is no perfect plan, you know, uh, reading through your uh, information that you provided me, you talked about 
you know, in as all of us in the military understand, you, know, you have a plan, but you know, the enemy has a vote. That first contact with the enemy changes so many things. You know, so what is that guy or gal, that junior guy or gal, how are they going to react if they're not actually working through those scenarios and having to make those decisions void of, you know, somebody hovering in, you know, on the <laughs> on the laptop, giving them explicit instructions on, you know, go here, do this, you know, whatever that might be. So the other thing is the commandant has also talked about, yeah, we don't really need all these young folks. Uh, let's have a little bit older, smarter cadre of people. Okay. I mean, I, yeah, I get some of that, but I, I, I would bet, <laughs> I would bet my life on if we're going to be in the Pacific here in the coming, you know, years, uh, we're, we're going to need a hell of a lot of young folks to, to get that done. And, you know, trying to restart that thing. Uh, I mean, Timing wise, I think we're in a shit sandwich and I usually don't cuss, at least not in this type of form. <laughs> Uh, you know, the Marine in me, I have to swallow a lot uh, because that's how Marines are when it comes to, you know, to language. But, yeah, I've I, I have I have huge concerns for what's happening with the Marine Corps culturally, but then also, you know, how we will fight in the future. Logistics has to be in the forefront of all of this, getting folks to swallow that pill and, you know, be there as as co, you know, co-level importance. Uh, I, I don't know how many times going to the schools that I went to, logistics just gets fairy dusted, and you're looked so at as the, the yeah, I mean, you know, you're you're yeah. It, well, we want to get through this. Well, that's nice. Yeah, no crap. But if you're not thinking about these things logistically, you're not going to get through it when it's happening in real time because it's not supportable. So you know, as long as you know that. And just like you said, you know, uh, you have to be able to speak up. You have to be able to talk to those issues. And there's a way to do it, obviously. And it's, it's a learned thing. Uh, I, I was not good at keeping my mouth shut. Now, I, I, I was very purposeful not to, you know, intentionally piss folks off. But I, but I did learn to, you know, speak my piece because the commander deserves it, whether he likes it or not you know, really isn't the issue, but as long as you've done your job and you've informed him or her of the things that are in your purview, your swim lane, then, you know, you've done uh, what you're paid to do. Uh, and so anyhow, <laughs> I'm hijacking your it's time tough. here, but no. you, you can, you can hear the passion in my voice because I, I see these things and a lot of this isn't new. Uh, you know, you, the, the, the Navy is still screwing around with amphibs. You know, why are we habitually in that argument, in that space to where the Navy and the Marine Corps are tripping over each other about what amphibs are going to look like, how many we're going to have, what are their capabilities? You know, it's crazy. You know, so put that yeah, on top of everything else that we're talking about. And, you know, we, we've got some significant issues and we need guys like you to help figure this stuff out. And I know that's what you're doing now. So uh, instead of me hijacking <laughs> you know, your interview with- I, I think in, in going forward, and I'm gonna talk identity, right? And I think, you know, foundational root, you know, in the Marine Corps, like what's our identity? Who are we? What's our purpose, right? And I'm gonna bridge this into, into transition too, because I think if you don't have a clear identity, if you don't have a clear vision of where you're going and what you're doing. It's really hard to decide how to do it, right? And, and Absolutely. If you look at the last 20 years, and, and actually I commend you know, the commandant for being a visionary. I commend him for being bold, right? And this is going to change management. Now you do change management. Why I think the Marine Corps and the military overall is the poster child on how to do it wrong and not get fired. Um, yep. But he was bold, right? And I even commend my commander, you know, one night at the time when, when Hawthorne happened, he was a visionary and he was bold. He wanted to get us out of the desert warfare mentality and he wanted to teach us how to go to any climate, any place. So he was pushing us in terms of training. Now, his fault was he wanted it now and he didn't want to be told no and he wanted to train one to 7,000 level TNR manual simultaneously, right? So in that terms, you know, he failed and we see what happened at Hawthorne as a result, right, of leadership. But he was still a visionary, you know, and I think in that regard, I respect the commandant for what he's trying to do. 
whether I agree with the direction or not, you know, we'll see where the future goes. I have friends that are tankers that are really now the living dinosaur of the Marine Corps, right? Because, you know, they're gone. And, and what does that mean in the future? At the same time, when you look at the, the EABO fight and amphibious and the time it takes to get ashore, I mean, I don't know, you know, but he's at least- you know, Bridging uh, how, how we connect with the Army. Right. Uh, you know, I guess maybe that gets us out of some of the stuff that we were involved in in, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, possibly. But, you know, does it give them the- ability to say you know the marine corps is nice but you guys look like army now so well, and that's the concern is the identity piece there too which is who yep. are we and what value do you have and i think you know when we look at that foundation we start looking at transition and my passion in transition overall right you know i didn't know how to explore the identity question i didn't know how to explore or even sit and deal with the fact that i am a marine and when i take off the uniform i don't know what else i am without that uniform on Right. I think that really hits a lot of, of soldiers and, and veterans in transition is that I was birthed into this family and now I'm no longer a part of that family anymore, but I'm still a veteran. So I'm kind of a part of the family, but I'm not a civilian and I don't know where I fit. Right. And I think admitting that that part sucks. And in my case, I got kicked out of the family. Right. I got non-promoted four years straight. Um, that hurt. Right. Flat out. I devoted my time to the military. I did not want to retire. Or I did not want to transition. I want to retire. You know, I had a contract. I wanted to keep making change. I wanted to be valued and I wanted to grow. And, and on the manpower side, I just stayed a captain my whole career. And if I had six more months in and if I had known the game to play, I could have deferred this and I probably could have gotten in stayed in. But I didn't know. Right? I didn't know the game. Right? Right. I probably should have gone guard, honestly, because I went, left the Marine Corps. I should have gone in the Army Reserve or the guard and started over. And But my pride wouldn't let me eat the fact that I'm a Marine and I'm not going to go anywhere else. You know, so I kind of floundered. You know, I took the easy way out. I was dependent. I used a headhunter which to me was like trout fishing, right? They threw my resume in front of a pool of starving fish and I was guaranteed to take a fish home, you know, and the dust settled and I ended up somewhere, right? And it was uncomfortable to want to sit and say, who am I? What do I really want to be doing? And where do I want to go? And I've learned a lot over the years about how to explore that. I've learned a lot doing requirements development in the military, ironically enough, because we suck at identifying requirements. We ask for solutions without communicating needs. And that's a human nature problem overall. Yes. And I think it also, it stems from that lack of a clear vision. And so in transition, my passion, you know, as I've grown, you know, proline through networking, you know, I've created a model I call hunting versus fishing, right? And the first step in the hunt is knowing what and why you're hunting, right? Because I can fish all I want to. I can try to throw my resume in the water and hope to catch a fish and if you want a bigger fish, put shiny stuff on there like certifications and degrees and make yourself stand out. But one, there's no guarantee there's a fish in that pond and there's no guarantee it's a fish you want to take home. So it's a very passive model. And it, in the hunting analogy, you know, step one, I said is what and why am I hunting, right? Explore your passions, explore your identities, explore the things you really want to be involved in because you may realize that the solution to your desires is not the job title you thought. Right. So if I sit down and go, who am I? Right. Strengths Finder 2.0 is amazing. Your disc profile, Myers Briggs, Discover Your Why by Simon Sinek. Right. Know yourself. Right. Know your enemy. Know yourself. Well, you are the only dependent thing in transition. Right. So you have to be able to sit down and say, who am I? Right. What is my purpose now? What purpose do I want to have? Am I okay taking this uniform off? Is my family okay taking that uniform off? What impact is it going to have when I walk out there? Because I don't know anymore. And I have to start asking those questions like, what, what vision do I want to have? What purpose do I want to have? And once I start identifying my requirements from a you know, physiological standpoint, a pay standpoint, and a location standpoint, I can map those things out. I can then start exploring opportunities. And this goes to requirements, right? If I've defined the requirement, I can explore procurements that might meet the vision and need of this product or this thing. And if I can map those correctly, I might give myself a lot more options than I thought I had. And I'm I give a class called the Empowered Transition. You know, we're in acquisition in the Marine Corps. It's like, I tell someone to buy me an Xbox. And I get the Xbox. I'm like, I don't want an Xbox. It's like, well, why not? It's like, well, because I want to digitally interface with some world to conduct training and virtual things. Like, why didn't you ask me for that? You didn't ask me for the right thing. You know, and I think veterans go out and it's like, someone needs, you know, you need to get your PMP. And obviously I'm hugely passionate on project management, but you don't need it, right? If it doesn't get you to where you want to go, it's not value added, right? And that's like carrying a whole kit bag of stuff into the fight that doesn't meet my mission requirement. Why are we carrying all this crap? If someone said to carry it with you. Well, why? Because the last guy took it with him. Well, the last guy added 20% onto the last pack and the last guy added 20% on the last pack. <laughs> That's the way we've always done crap. it, yeah. <laughs> so much unnecessary crap because everyone just said to do it. And we haven't done the critical analysis of 
where am I going and what do I need to get there? And you know, so once we start with that, you know, you can start talking to people, you can start networking and talking to hunting guys, right? People in different industries to say, what kind of animals exist out there that might meet my needs? Am I sport hunting for quail? Do I just like being in the woods and sitting in a deer stand? And I don't care if I ever get a job. I just want to sit here and, and be in the wilderness. Or, hey, I need to take home a lot of meat because I'm a single breadwinner with no benefits and I need to help. So I better get you know some big fat job to be comfortable. You yeah, know? Joshua, I, I, I love your analogy there with the, you know, it's kind of classifying as, a you know, fishing and hunting. You know, I grew up doing both and yeah, I, boy, I, 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 I'm eating this up. This is, I've actually never heard it put that way. And I, I love what you're saying. This is, this is true. And it's a great way to think about, you know, what you're saying and your, your piece about, you know, the identity thing is huge. And it's something that I think if, People who leave service, uh, whether it's, you know, the military or, say, first responders, you know, police officers, uh, firefighters, uh, paramedics, you know, folks that are into these intense um, professions that require everything you have, you know, mentally, spiritually, physically, just like the military. Yep. When you're leaving, I guarantee you, if you ask folks and they answered honestly that's the one thing that they just didn't think of is, you know, who am I? You know, what's my identity? How, how is all that going to play out? Because especially if you did it, I think it's harder for folks that have spent more time in, you know, that kind of makes sense, right? Uh, because it's become everything of who you are for, say, you know, 20, 30 years. And so that whole identity thing is a big part of transition that doesn't get a whole lot of press uh, until you're in the weeds and you're floundering. And some people don't do well with that, you know, and they, you know, I, I talk about this all the time, you know, they, they can, they can go down the wrong path and there's a lot of wrong paths to go down, you know? So yeah, it, it, it it's an absolutely, it's thin ice and folks need to be aware of that. And so I'm glad that we're, that you're bringing that up. Yeah. And in, you know, I've jokingly said, you know, being in the military is like being a part of a family. You know, you finish boot camp like kindergarten. You know, you're given the freedom of a kindergartner where you're at least allowed to feed yourself. And that's about the only responsibility you have. You know, and then your first, you know, mid-level schools like junior high, where I have some siblings that live at home. But my entire purpose is making sure they don't piss off mom and dad. You know, you eventually go to high school where you learn a little bit more and you have more siblings to take care of. Who Your still whole purpose is to not piss off mom and dad. And if you're lucky, your top level school at the general or E9 level, you're still a college graduate because you still live at home. Mom and dad pay for your house and tell you what clothes to wear and your entire existence is to make sure the rest of your siblings still don't piss off mom and dad. Right. <laughs> I mean, and then you leave and you got to find this new landing point as you, you know, find out what you want to do when you grow up. But the truth is, again, the longer you're in, the more dependent you are on the benefits, the more dependent you are on the BAH and the things that are there. And when you finally leave, you now have to provide for things in ways that you've never even known you had to provide before, you know, and, and that's where, you know, the identity piece is huge, but it's also realizing that you have more responsibility than you've ever had. You're going to show up at a company and your rank doesn't matter anymore. And you have more capability than a company knows what to do with. Because, you know, as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps, you've led more people than some companies may have in their employee roster, right? It's so true. you have more responsibility as an O1 in the Marine Corps as a platoon commander than a CEO at a startup because he has three people or five people and you had 40. I mean, and so realizing and being comfortable with that is, is hard. Helping industry realize what veterans can really do is hard. And that's where you kind of show up as a fostered foreign orphan, where the company will never adopt you again. You speak funny. You're forever veteran. You outpace <laughs> outwork. And I can't understand you. And I don't know why you try so hard. And I'm willing to give you loyalty you don't deserve. And it's this weird family dynamic, because if they don't like me, they keep me back to the orphanage. And if I don't like them, I'm free to leave. You know, and how do you deal with that right and that's where you know my passion on certs and i'll kind of walk to the end of the hunting analogy is certs are kind of the badges of industry right they allow you to connect they allow you to speak common terms they allow you to show up and be understood right where if i walk in with medals on my chest that doesn't mean anything right i can walk in with patches on my shoulder and badges and everything else and that's cool because the only thing i know about marines is you know full metal jacket you know heartbreak ridge and major pain and you're like one of those. I mean, 
I'm joking about yeah. it. Yeah, it, it, looks, it looks sexy, but if you don't understand it, uh, you know, it means nothing. <laughs> Correct. And I think that's part of the bridge that we get to divide. You know, so so after I talk to a hunting guide, I can eventually find a spotter, right? I can find somebody inside that company and I can use LinkedIn to find a fellow veteran to talk to them and say, what's it like being there? Does the company match my requirements? Is there a position in the company that's a better fit for me? How do I get hired? And then the next piece is, can you help me assess where I'm weak, right? How do my knowledge, skills, and abilities align with the business requirements of the job, right? Because every job post has some required and desired experience, right? And it's like, hey, this one says I'm looking for, you know, PMP. This one says I'm looking for, you know, SHRM or some cert or some experience or some college degree, right? I don't have that, but the question to ask is, are those required or desired? Because the company's fishing too. They're fishing Absolutely. with the job posts. You know, Joshua, and, the, you know, what, what you said about, I, I want to stop for one second right. and draw attention to what you just said about your weaknesses. That's when it's time to put the big boy pants on, right? Because not everyone is good at that because they don't want to, you know, reveal that, you know, yeah, I could be better here or I don't have this. You know, <laughs> you have to be able to understand what your shortcomings, weaknesses, whatever you want to call them are you know, identify them so that you can figure that out and work to it, you know, but the, the part you're talking about on the interface with the company is that's important too, because, you know, you need to know what you're getting into career wise, right? You know, you need to have expectations, you need to manage those expectations. And, you know, you don't want to get into something that you're going to wind up hating. Now, sometimes you just need a job, you know, because, you know, like you said, you've got a family to support, you have <laughs> bills, you know, and so you need employment. And I, I think there's an interesting thing that you see on LinkedIn. Uh, some folks are always talking about, you know, that dream job that, okay, that's nice, it's aspirational, but they tell you don't sell yourself short. And they really hammer home putting all of your eggs into uh, an end state that may or may not ever come. And I always tell folks, don't sell yourself short in the short run, because sometimes you just need to get on first base. You're not going to always hit it over the fence. You're not going to always have a grand slam. So, But you need, you need to be tactical and strategical, and you need to understand where you are in time and space. And sometimes that first landing gives you some stability so that you can breathe and you know have your head on a swivel looking around to figure out maybe the things that you didn't put time into figuring out before you left. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's doing it kind of backwards, but so many people aren't transitioning well. And so that first job might be just that. It is. And I think that's my vision. If I had to give you my vision is I want to make transition start three to five years out. Right. And, you know, so that you can start upgrading your weapon. So in this hunting analogy, you are the weapon of the fight. Right. And, if you don't have enough weight in terms of credibility, your bullet, the resume you fire, may not take out the target you intend, right? It's like carrying a 22 and even a 308, right? Like, I don't care how good your <laughs> shot is, you may just piss off the target or it's going to bounce and go. Or if I don't know how to craft and understand the business environment and the requirements, you know, I may put, you know, <laughs> slug in there and I need bird shot, right? Like, <laughs> I obliterated the target and they're like, you're overqualified, I don't want you. It's like, yeah, because I didn't know that I need to tailor it and to craft it. But if I don't have the capability, if I don't have the weight of credibility, it doesn't matter how good or pretty my resume is. It's not going to matter. It's not going to have that impact. And if I haven't taken the time to assess my gaps, to then use the resources that really are plentiful in uniform, like you know, unit funding or Army Ignited or Air Force Cool or the programs are out there. So I can really start upgrading my capability to bridge industry and military so that when I get into transition, it's just simply taking out your target, right? Because I've taken time to explore what I want to do. You know what I mean? You know, absolutely. And, and you know, I see where you're going with this. And, and, and I know that's part of what you are doing now, you know, and you believe it and you're a, a heck of an advocate for it. And let, let's look at this real quick. Let, let's say, you know, you're a commander, uh, you know, either a, you know, battalion or regimental commander, or even a company commander. And you see uh, folks that are interested in, these certs and stuff. And some of these guys and gals are probably thinking, Hey, you know what? Uh, he's more focused on what he's going to be doing when he leaves than he is with 
you know, with, with what I want, you know, with, you know, what's nested and higher. Um, and so, you know, I can imagine that's a bit of a challenge, but I, and I know what you're doing is it, it's kind of a, it blends so well because it's not just for when you leave, it is absolutely applicable to what you're doing now in the military. Yeah. You know, it's when you look at, and, and we'll talk about this, I'm sure, but when you look at the, say the Marine Corps planning process and civilian planning processes, you know, there's some, you know, there's some overlay there where, there, where it's complementary, but there are also things that are done different, you know, agile and other things that aren't being used per se in the military that is additive and it's, it's good. Well, and being able to, to know that and use that in real time when you're in the military makes, makes you not only more valuable, but it also brings credibility to the processes that are being used right. and hopefully better understood with the military because they've got to get better at coming into the 21st century when it comes to planning and, and execution. And I and what you're doing, I think, is absolutely critical to that. And and I applaud you and, and the organizations that you're with that are that are doing just that. No, I appreciate that. And I think part of it is, you know, there's a phrase in the civilian, you know, world, I don't know who said it, um, probably one of the key like CEOs, like, hey, what if we develop <laughs> all the employees and they leave? And then someone says, yeah, but what if we don't develop them and they stay? Right. right? I mean, <laughs> so, you know, when I kind of take that approach and, and I'll, I'll talk through the merging of, of project management our, our passion right now as a company, but, you know, why not develop a capability to make better civilians in uniform, right? Why not in, integrate industry best practices and certifications so that the planning process becomes more effective and more lean and more agile so that the doers making decisions on a defined contract can lead and execute more effectively today and then automatically have options when they transition later. So the volunteer force becomes a voluntary for life because I chose to stay, not because I had no better choice but to stay, right? What does that do for the mindset and the loyalty that you're given to not have to cover my ass, right? Not have to see why because I'm so concerned about having to leave anymore, but it says, I know I'm set when I leave because I can speak both. I know that I'm set when I leave because I'm not only a one-trick pony who has to become a security guard at Walmart because I'm an infantryman and I have no other skills to bring to the table, which is crap, by the way. Um, there's so much to bring to the table, but if I don't bridge Amen. that, then I feel like I'm stuck. And that makes me more ineffective initially in transition because I don't know how to survive on my own. And that goes back to the empowered decision-making we're trying to build with EABO. Right, I need to make sergeants able to survive on their own in a combat environment, and I need to be able to make them survive on their own as civilians. So making better leaders in uniform today makes more effective decision makers today, and it creates better citizens later. So where does project management come into play? Right, If you look at software development and agile as a construct, gee, it's for a team of 12 or less people. That's a common structure in the military. Right, and they're dealing with a rapidly changing environment. And their whole purpose is to take and translate the customer's vision into actionable work and then go to their team and let their team design how they're gonna get it done because the job of a project manager in Agile is to lead, serve, and equip his team with the resources they need to do the job that they're gonna do, right? It's like, wow, it sounds like, you know, command mitigation and decentralized command and commander's intent. But we suck at clear visions because I can just see the process and I'll just steer it in stride and build the ship as we go. That's great when you're the platoon commander, not so good when you're the CEO. Um, but it's a direct compliment. And then you're dealing with, you know, how do I see what's in work? How do I make sure that everything I'm doing is value added? And how much can I get done given constrained resources and time, right? So that I'm always in line with the vision of the work. You know, then you integrate Lean Six. There's a DOD mandate, actually a directive from 2008 that says everyone in the government should do Lean Six Sigma. Why? Because it's about making sure you're doing things at cost and make you more efficient. I've used it as a task force XO in Afghanistan, rechanging our admin and supply process. And it was hugely effective. Didn't save us money, it saved us time because I don't control budgets, but I do have time limits. You know, and that becomes more effective in terms of process mapping. And then you get into the PMP world, which is about you know, senior level planning, because you're right, the military planning process stops at issue the order. Well, as a, as a civilian and why project management is so effective and necessary is once I write the plan, I still have to execute the plan. And if I don't, it's going to hurt the brand of my company. It's going to cost me money and it might get me fired or make me go bankrupt, right? So I have to be able to not only plan effectively, I have to be able to communicate effectively and I have to execute effectively 
or there's catastrophic consequences as a civilian, right? As the military side, it may just be someone's coming out on the weekend and I don't pay for the labor anyway, so I'm sorry, Lance Corporal, you got hosed, right? <laughs> so that's just what it is. Um, but if we integrated these things and we empowered decision-making down to the lowest possible level, then people are able to do more now, be more effective today, speak both sides of the coin from civilians and industry and military, be able to interact with foreign entities because these are global concepts and terms. And then when I transition, I have millions of job opportunities available because I can speak business and I can speak process and I can speak the civilian language to walk in with credibility that gives me choices, right? And you know that's our passion is like, these aren't civilianizing your workforce. These are integrating best of breed from right. the civilian world to make you more effective now. And, you know, I've got some white papers and point papers about it. You know, we're trying to integrate this in the army as an ongoing voluntary development program. I'm trying to integrate it in the Marine Corps. I talked to guys at SOI East and some of the gunners out there even this morning. You know, I'm talking in the Air Force too about, you know, General Brown's guidance on innovate, change, or lose. It's like, that's great, but you haven't empowered the people to make the decision to be the E3, right? You're leaving it at the one-star level and therefore no one's going to take action because, you haven't made the process agile enough to let the people impacted by that change be a part of the decision. So, sorry, it's a slight passion of mine. If you can't tell. No, absolutely. <laughs> no, it, it, it's you know, it's, it's a smart process, and you know, oftentimes because of how rigid things are, you know, in the hierarchy uh, and personality certainly come to play. Uh, I think. Sometimes folks in charge are intimidated by intelligent people. Not that they're not, you know, smart guys and gals as well, but I, I don't think that they manage that part of the, the human aspect of people, communication and how we do things, how we work together uh, because of the rank that you wear, you know, uh, you get kind of put into a box and then a little bigger box. And then, you know, so kind of like you were talking about earlier, the progression uh, and the responsibility that comes with progression. You know, if we're not loading our folks early and, you know, holding them accountable, but then also being accountable as the Yourself, yeah. as the senior guy uh, in the decisions you make or don't make or the failures you have, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's a tricky business because not everyone – is able to kind of connect the dots and see the goodness that comes with these, the best of breed that you talk to, you know, you get folks that are just, you know, they're day on, stay on nose to the grind core. This is the Marine Corps, you know, yada, 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 you know, it is absolutely. But don't we want to, don't we want to be better? Don't we want to be smarter? Don't we want to, you know, win at the end of the day? So how do we do that? You know, you have to be open to these other things and you know what, you know, make them a little green, you know, that that's cool too. You know, so maybe, maybe that's the way you, you, you get folks interested, you know, uh, I think but, there's, there's ways to do it. You know, the, the army's done a really good job by converting TA funding to pay for certifications now called credentialing <laughs> assistance. So it takes the same benefit and just repurposes it because education isn't just formal learning, right? Certs out there and licenses <laughs> in some cases are more beneficial than a degree. Um, yep. I'm trying Absolutely. to get DOD to consider that, you know, get the Army Navy to consider it because everyone has TA already allocated into the budget, but can I just repurpose that for new things like the Army does? You know, if we can do that, we're talking to universities about, you know, building an accredited degree or certification training program so I can actually pursue credits towards a degree and get a cert at the same time. Um, so we're hoping to get those launched this year as well. Um, That's tremendous. It really comes down to, you know, the willingness to just be, be wrong. I think the willingness to say we're not doing it the right way, the willingness to say that somebody else might be better and that doesn't make my identity any less. And I think that's, you know, the immaturity of leadership, you know, where if I'm confident, you know, if I'm an okay quarterback and I've got a rock star running back, I want him on my team. I'm not threatened by him making me look worse. I'm wanting him because we're going to win the game. And it's about the team. And I think that's really where I like agile as a concept. It's really aligned with soft and what I learned with soft. When I was there, where your rank where it doesn't matter anymore. You know, I have a patch on, on my patch board that I was given by a team sergeant that says, don't confuse your rank with my ability to kick your ass. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and I took that as a badge of honor, you know, that I had earned their respect enough to give me a hard time. 
because I was not, I'm not special forces, right? I was a Marine logistician and I was privileged to be an XO when I was there, you know, and I, and I took that as, as a moment of pride for me that they were willing to, you know, give me crap, you know, yeah. because I earned their respect <laughs> to waste their time to, you know, bust my balls. Um, you know, so, you know, I think there's a lot we can do. I think, you know, for those in transition, start thinking now to upgrade today, you know, don't wait until the last minute to, to really explore options of what you want to do. Um, your, your benefits start drying up the closer you get out because then it really becomes, there's no return on the investment for the government to invest in this training or upgrading your weapon system. Um, the GPC I learned can pay for lots of courses out there as long as they're in line with the MOS. So knowing how to use unit funding is little taught or not taught at all, which is a huge benefit and a resource to make better Marines, you know, send them Absolutely. to truck mechanic school or whatever, or in any service, you know, and, and just being willing to say, I want to do something that's completely different. You know, that, you know, you have to think now to set it up I mean, financially, life insurance. I mean, get yourself set up so you have options in transition rather than having to take whatever scraps come your way. Yep. You have to get ready today, right? If you're after boot camp, start getting ready today, right? Financially, professionally, you know, insurance wise, set yourself up today because you'll, you'll take whatever you get at the end if you don't. That, that's right. And let me ask you this when you, when you look at your, personal transition what's the one thing that when you look back on this that you wish you would have known and done um, and it's, it's you know i know it might be hard to kind of narrow it down to to one thing but is there any you know one or maybe a couple of things that stick out in your mind that while we you know i wish i would have known this uh, and if so you know i would have done this yeah it's, a, it's hard but don't take the easy way out i guess you know i use a headhunter that got me a job but i learned i was being half valued right i was making about half of what i could have made had i learned how to network um let your family be a part of the process because your transition affects them too and that's a good one know, while Amen. i was gone all the time doing project management i liked the job the salary was low and my family had a hard time supporting me being gone all the time, right? They were willing to support me being gone to support the military and the higher purpose. But when you're just gone, it impacted my family, you know, more than I thought about. All um, right. I highly recommend the reserves or go to the guard if you want. Um, if you're passed over on active duty, look into the guard first. Why? Because there's no waiver to get there afterwards. Um but that family reunion once a month psychologically for me was a huge blessing that I didn't even think about that just being able to go home and be around people like me and talk common language and be wanted and valued and not have to justify it. Right. was psychologically for me, a, a huge blessing that I, I didn't even think about. It wasn't on my radar at all. And I highly advocate stay in the reserves even for a little bit, because if the job doesn't work out, you take a set of orders. And you try again, right? It kind of gives you a risk mitigation strategy to, to have time to adjust, you know? And then, you know, two, two years later, when I finally, you know, couldn't play in the sandbox anymore, I was okay with it. I was much more okay with who I was and where I was than my first time when I got kicked out of the family. So then the reserves, I'm a huge advocate of reserves, even temporarily. Um, and just start well, earlier. Like the last thing yeah. you start earlier is it's going to come no matter what, start early. Uh, yeah, those are all very salient points and, and they, they resonate and they should resonate with everyone that will hear this and something that you, you hit on about, you know, an affiliation, you know, a brotherhood, sisterhood kind of thing. Uh, when we do leave, that's something that I think, again, we underestimate the value that that brings to who we are, to our sense of purpose. And that's, something that uh, that I kind of learned the hard way that, you know, I, I mean, I was busy to the very end. I, I you know, I, I won't go into my story, but I know for me, you know, it was huge that it was a disconnect that I just didn't think about. And in one day, you're not who you were. All the folks that you served with have moved on. You know, you get marched up to the gate, but the band doesn't go with you. They they do an about face and go back. You know, you're, the gate shuts and you're on your own, uh, you know, for lack of a better way of saying it. So you have to make it understood that, hey, look, I'm not by myself. Uh, I need to stay connected 
with people that are like me and whether that's going to um, organizations like the you know veteran of foreign wars or american legion or the hundreds of organizations nonprofits that are out there doing great work in the veteran space to where there's folks just like you that you love and that you have an, uh, an affinity for that help you know build that next chapter in your right. life while yeah. helping you to still have those connections to the things that you love about service. And I think that's something for me that I, I wasn't thinking about. And I think a lot of folks aren't. I think that's so important. It's your own tribe. And I think, you know, I talk about this too, like building your own tribe because you don't just get to walk in and have it anymore. You know, and I yep. think even for me getting my VA disability a card when I could go back on base and it felt like I was finally given access, like a key to the house again. And just <laughs> that feeling that knows I can go to the commissary and shop if I want to. I mean, it's, it's little things that you kind of take for granted and don't think about, but the tribe doesn't come to you anymore, right? You don't just get to be in that family. You have to build that family around you. And veterans are willing to help, you know, looking on LinkedIn, you know, my last comment here, I think just you know, for time is treat LinkedIn like a bar, right? If you see someone who's a fellow vet, add them to your network and send them a note that says, I want to talk to you. And I did that to you. I've done that now growing, a, you know, a successful company by just adding everyone I thought who's a veteran and saying, I want to help people. Can I help you? Do you need anybody else I can help? And building a tribe around you of like-minded people that are willing to come to your aid or be involved in the church or be involved in something else to build that community for yourself because it doesn't just show up anymore. The company culture as a civilian company isn't going to be like that. Now, some do, but most of the time it's like I go to work and I go home and work isn't home. And in the military, like work is home almost. And it's right. something you can't replace and you deploy together and that's your family when you're there. And it's just different. It's not bad. It, it just is. And if you don't understand that and don't get ready for it, then it hits you and surprises you and it hurts much more. You know, hey, uh, Joshua, I just I just got a, a quick flag on something here real quick. Hey, uh, David, uh, if you're still there, can you do me a favor? Can you fill in for just a second? Uh, I hate to do this, but I have to make a quick uh, exit here. I'll be right back. But uh, David, if you can just... Uh, chat real quick with Joshua. And then if you have a question or if someone's got a question for Joshua, go ahead and start that. I'll be right back. Okay. okay. We good? Sounds good. Yep. Okay. Be right back. Uh, so open the audience now for everyone as well. And, you know, come off mute and start talking if you want or anything I can help out with, you know, be welcome to, to field anything. Paul, thanks for your comments going into there too. You know, Can you hear me? Audio's trying. There it goes. Um, I'm in the middle of reading um, Marine Maxim, and it's got some insight. And I share this to indicate that it is well worth the read um, if anybody's interested. It's sure, about leadership. It's about um, who you are, uh, trust. It's uh, there are things that it's about, and each one of them he writes so well. Um, and what's fascinating, I got uh, he has now become the commandant of the Citadel. Um, so I guess he'll be moving into that journey and. The people that come out of there are going to be much different than, than when they entered. And that's a promise. That's just the way he operates. Yep. I just looked it up. I'll take a take a look at that. 
Okay, can I have you say? Kindle. I, I have huh? difficulty reading, and and so um, it, it's it's available on the Kindle, and if you have it or like that, it's it's a very easy thing to read and to follow. And you want to be a place where you can make notes because with references, <laughs> all of which are worth. I mean, I've I've, I've probably eight chapters of it, and I've already got thirty books that I need to refer to. Uh, that's <laughs> a, idea of how well this has been done. Yeah. I mean, I like I just pulled a preview on toxic leadership. Don't be an ass and bad leaders drive out good leaders. And I will tell you flat out in the Marine Corps, that second one is 100% true. And I am part of the victimization of that exact cause, right? That, you know, bad leaders sacrifice good leaders. And I think, you know, even in the Air Force, not change. And we didn't hit a lot on change management. But you have to you have to promote and reward the characteristics you want to sustain. You know, and I think if I looked at any gap right now in terms of the changes at least among the Air Force that they're trying to make, you know, in terms of empowered decision making and innovation, is you have to start rewarding people who are willing to take risks. You got to stop promoting the gray matter and the gray men and women who simply play in the boundaries. But the hard part is, if you look at the extremes, and you know, I'd like to think I fell into one of these, but those on the upper end of innovation, thought, and intelligence look a whole lot like the people on the very bottom end as disruptors and nonconformists and pains in the ass, right? So you have to know how to see the value of the good ones and weed out the bad and not sacrifice them, but you have to reward and promote the values you want to keep and sustain. And, you know, I think that goes to companies too, that you have to build intentional growth and know what you're looking for. And companies struggle with building an intentional growth plan to allow people to move and, and develop or get out and help them get out and say, this is where I want you to go and I'm intentionally making you grow if you'd like to and help them get there. And that's where we wanna build the bridge you know, with PM Perlin on the organizational side to build intentional growth and development plans, to build you know, training and development into employee life cycles to build better people. And if they leave, they leave, great. They'll fill a void that someone can step up into. But I think this is not a culture in the corporate world that the military does where you intentionally grow as well. So you know, I'd love to see organizations get into that but anyway you know just another thought one of one of the things that that uh, thomas gordon talks about is uh, a thing called the bell curve yep. and he says 10 percent of the people hey paul i don't know whether you can hear me or not, but it, uh, it looks yeah, like your audio. The there you go. Yeah, Paul, uh, yeah, looks like we're having a problem with your audio. It's uh, it kind of froze on us. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It's on the bell curve and it cut out. If you focus on the top 10%, who are your first, your leaders? And you create an avenue for, for them to communicate with you freely, um, respectfully, but freely. Um, learn their trust and we'll pass that down through the people too. And those bottom 10%. Are either going to get the program, get with the program, or they're going to go away. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it's the same thing, but you got to be able to identify them and be comfortable enough with them to speak freely, and that takes maturity of leadership. That's right. that a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of people don't have because they're threatened by people that are maybe better than they are. Instead of seeing them and, and good to great and winning are great books as well, and putting the right people on the bus and finding the right seat for them on the bus. And if you find that good one, find a seat for them instead of this is the peg in the hole you were stuck in bloom. So anyway. Yeah, yeah Joshua, I, you know, obviously I thank you for, you know, indulging me with uh, having to go there. <laughs> but, That's not right, that no choice, but, uh, but hey, thanks for, uh, you know, it sounds like there were some good uh, discussions happening uh, while I was out here. But, you know, to what you're talking about, 
now and uh, not having full understanding of the discussion, but uh, this particular part is, is that is a big thing. And, and I even, t I think we talked to that a little bit earlier about, you know, I think some leaders are intimidated and feel threatened by folks who are junior that are smart and that have, you know, right. maybe better ways of doing things. And instead of taking it personal or instead of seeing it as a challenge to authority, figuring out a way that you can incorporate what's being presented to you, understanding the value of what's of, of the proposition, right? And like you said, figuring out a way to keep that guy or gal on the bus and be an active part of what your mission is and how you accomplish that. And, you know, I, I was blessed along the way that I, I, I had excellent leaders. There were two in my 20 years that were not. Uh, one got in trouble as a colonel, which was very interesting. Uh, the other one uh, wound up becoming, you know, a, a general officer. Uh, yeah, interesting. You know, it's inter it's interesting who makes it and for how long, uh, because some people are very abrasive. Some folks are it's my way or the highway. Uh, you know, they're the smartest guy in the room, and nothing's gonna, you know, <laughs> that that paradigm won't shift uh, until maybe someone above them hits them over the head. But a lot of times that stuff is kind of rewarded, you know. Correct. Well, it's, it's and, like timing and luck too. And I think, you know, unfortunately I do have another call. I got to jump on here. So I hate to wrap it up too soon, but it's timing and luck too, right? And I think the right personality at the right time sometimes gets promoted in a year earlier, it would have been kicked out, you know, because the need of the organization fit that skill set and that requirement at the right time, right? And the, right. You know, General Mattis might tell you this too, that Outside of a wartime, his personality might not have made it. General Mattis is a tremendous wartime general, right? But he's not political. And he, you know, he's, he's upset a lot of the wrong people, you know, at the right time. But sometimes it's, you know, again, I think God has a plan for us and he opens doors at the right time for us to be able to go where we want to go. And if you're not religious, and it's fine. But I think there's more to it and there's more purpose. And I would not trade anything I've been through as painful as it's been because I think my purpose is being fulfilled today that was necessary. And I'm blessed to do what I get to do. I'm blessed to be around the people that I get to be around and to be able to affect change that, you know, we're seeing that to affect, right? So that people can have a better journey than I did. And people can learn more than what I did because we get to have an impact if you choose to have an impact and you can bless people around you by simply staying active because we all have a need, we all have a purpose. And it's not just about making somebody else money, you know, and it's, it's more than that. So, you know, I'll say if anybody wants to connect with me, reach out, I'll be glad to talk. Um, you know, Scott, thank you for the, the chance to be here. You know, for this, I know I could go on hours and hours with you where I'm thinking this thing would never end because I think we'll just keep hanging <laughs> on each other. Um, <laughs> but if anyone has any last questions or thoughts, you know, I'd love to, to take them or, you know, keep chatting afterwards. Oh, absolutely. I think that's a, a actually a very fantastic way to, to wrap up, uh, you know, our discussions here in, um, who you are and, and what you're doing and what you believe. And yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful for your time today, Joshua. And, you know, the, the last thing you spoke to about, you know, God has a plan for all of us, you know, sometimes we don't understand the plan. Uh, sometimes it's a difficult plan, but, you know, having faith and, you know, opening yourself up to what that plan is, uh, is something that's, quite incredible, you know, uh, having the faith to, to make that walk. It's not an easy one. Uh, and there's, you know, that's a whole nother discussion, but, but thanks <laughs> for bringing that up because I think that's so, in, it's very important. It's, you know, it's what life's about in the end, you know, uh, in the people that are involved in all of that matter. And so, so, so it, I guess to this end, um, uh, it looks like a couple of folks had to, had to roll. Uh, so it looks like it's just down, let me see. Uh, it's down to um, me, you, Paul, and David. So, uh, David, uh, do you have any? Uh, I, I didn't, you know, I stepped away. I don't know. Did you have any questions or, you know, anything that you want to, to add before we uh, close shop here? Uh, uh, thanks, Josh, for uh, sharing, you know, all of that uh, special discussions for sure. And I, 
So I, as uh, Scott knows and as Paul knows, uh, I'm not a veteran. I was never in the military. However, I was a police officer for 20 years, and so many. Of and the, God bless uh, you too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks and so you. many of these uh, concepts translate from the greater military service into the smaller segment of law enforcement. And uh, leadership is uh, definitely not plentiful in the law enforcement world. Good leadership, I should say, is not plentiful in the law enforcement mm-hmm. world. So, um, so much of it uh, you know, resembles what we pass through as well. So thank you for, for sharing everything you have. Uh, it was a pleasure to listen to your story. You're welcome, Dave. Thanks for everything you do. You know, Paul, thanks for being here as well and contributing. Uh, I appreciate your comments in there. And, you know, Scott, thanks for the honor to come here and, and talk and, and be a voice that hopefully can impact change, you know, for others and help them along the road. Yes, I appreciate that. Your, yours is a, is a very good voice and we, we need more uh, voices in the choir. <laughs> so, uh, I, I absolutely, uh, again, thank you for your time. I want to welcome you back down the road as, as well. Yeah. Um, you. you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll chat more about that, uh, at another time, but, uh, okay. Now just real quick, uh, what we'll do here is we'll, we'll wrap up. And then as soon as this is available, I will send you the, the raw footage here of the interview. Sure. And if there's anything you want to adjust, edit, whatever, that's good to go. Uh, if not, you know, give me the thumbs up and then uh, Sarah will wind up posting this to YouTube under the power of our story. Perfect. That's, you know, my program is under her umbrella uh, and it'll it'll, you know, reside there on the YouTube uh, channel that she has. Again, the power of our story. Uh, and then I'll come back on LinkedIn with a segment. You know, I'll go through and yeah, find an appropriate couple minutes or so to post and, you know, put on LinkedIn for folks to go to this interview. So, Wonderful. again, thank you for your time, uh, Joshua. You're doing great things. Uh, it was an honor to have you on. And uh, God bless you and your family. Thanks, you too. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Amen. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.